The Old Testament lesson today is from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. It's in the Old Testament on page 698, if you'd like to follow along. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak wherever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. This is a reading from the New Testament, page 175. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. And the greatest of these is love. Our gospel reading this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 4, verses 21 to 30. It picks up right where we left off last week. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Fill this place, fill our hearts, Fill our minds. Inspire us. Amen. Amen. 
Today's sermon is entitled, Insecurity and Shame. Let's review. The man before the crowd in the synagogue in Nazareth was the Messiah, the incarnation of God, the living word made flesh. As we said last week, God was still speaking. God was speaking through his miracles, his relationships, his sermons, his flipping of tables, his love, his tears, his passion, his death, and his resurrection. And the people who were sitting there should have felt the same joy, as we talked about last week, that had struck the Babylonian Jews who had returned to Jerusalem so long ago. They should have felt that wholeness, that connection, that blessed assurance that their God was still with them, and that this time it was in the flesh. They should have been weeping with their joy. But that other bone-deep feeling struck them instead, bitterness. That feeling that had settled into the Israelites' bones back in the days of wandering in the wilderness when God had saved them from Egypt and they should have felt joy. Bitterness, that feeling that settles into our own bones when we get stuck on our own and others' insecurities and shame. When we remove love from the equation, That same old feeling settled into the bones of the synagogue crowd in Nazareth as this man they knew. This man they had helped raise as a child and surely loved at some point stood before them. What in the world happened? How did they go from all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth? to all were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they may hurl him off the cliff. What in the world happened between these two polar opposites? Let's go to the text and see. Then Jesus began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Aha. It wasn't just Jesus speaking to them. The people in the crowd were also speaking to each other. They had just sat through this remarkable declaration made by this holy man who was before them. They had been mesmerized by the words he spoke, by his interpretations of the scriptures. After all, God was speaking to them. And then it's as though they come out of a trance. They wake up to the fact that they actually know this guy. Wait a minute, isn't that Joseph's son? And Jesus hears them. And then Jesus goes off on a tirade about this place, his hometown. Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. Yikes. Jesus is basically saying, listen. There are lots of towns and villages around here that can be blessed by my words and my miracles. Y'all, Nazareth does not have to be one of them. For no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Again, ouch. I am a counselor, and I can usually tell when somebody has been triggered. And in this passage, Jesus has clearly been triggered. 
those simple words, isn't this Joseph's son, seem to have tapped into his deepest insecurities, his sense of shame. He was indeed the incarnate God, but that incarnation meant that he was fully human. He experienced what we experience. He felt what we feel. He went through the life stages that we go through. A few weeks ago, I talked about how Jesus was probably a bundle of nerves as he stood there in the crowd waiting to be baptized, anxious about what would happen once his public ministry commenced. And we've talked before about how Jesus felt great sadness and anger and love. So again, today, it's okay for us to talk about Jesus having insecurities and shame. And if we recognize this very human aspect of Jesus, we can more fully know the truth that God knows us intimately, that God understands what we go through, that God has actually been there. Isn't this Joseph's son? There was a lot more going on behind those words. Let's face it. We all know how we church people can be. Especially here in the Midwest where we have earned our reputation as being nice nasty. <laughs> to his face, oh look, it's Joseph's son. And then under our breath to our neighbor, but is he really Joseph's son? Remember, Mary was pregnant before they got married. I heard that maybe he belongs to somebody else. <laughs> Remember, they went to Bethlehem for the census and then didn't come back for years. I heard they ran away to another country. They must have been hiding something. I heard they couldn't even afford a room for his birth. I mean, what do you expect on a carpenter's salary? Oh, my. And remember his cousin, that crazy John? You know these things do run in the family. <laughs> we knew him as a child. He was kind of an oddball, reading all the time, just hanging around the synagogue. And now he thinks he can just waltz back in here and claim to be the fulfillment of the Holy Scriptures? Who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? Hey, who does he think he is? We've all been there. We've said things just like that to our neighbors. We've had things just like that said about us. We tap into each other's insecurities. We trigger each other's shame. Shame is one of the most powerful forces and feelings on this planet. It is that feeling that we have done something wrong by even existing. It is a feeling that transcends all humanity, but that somehow we personalize to the minutest detail. It is that feeling that no matter who we are, no matter what we do, we simply aren't enough. Not good enough. Not strong enough. Not beautiful enough. Not smart enough. Not capable enough. Not successful enough not stable enough, not well enough, not enough. It is something instilled within us from the very beginning. As infants, when we are hushed for crying about our need for food or touch, as toddlers, as we are shushed and tutted and tissed for being noisy in our exploration of the world, as elementary school students, when we are made fun of by peers and when adults start to differentiate us based on standardized understandings of intelligence. As middle schoolers, when our bodies start to change and our cliques start to form. As high schoolers, when we are judged for looking how we look or doing what we do 
and for starting to embrace our various identities. As young adults, when we are condemned for who we love, as middle-aged adults, when others comment on our lack of success or the success that is different from what society says, as older adults, when we become dependent again and begin to feel like a burden, it is the source of all of our guilt. It's the source of all of our insecurities. From shame, we build full societies based on unattainable standards. We say that skin should be a certain color, that accents should sound a certain way, that love should be a certain pairing, that bodies should be a certain shape, that minds should fit a certain type of sanity, that intelligence should fit a certain mold, that success should be measured by a certain way of doing things, that families should look a certain way. And in Jesus' time, that messiahs should embody a certain gravitas that couldn't have come from Nazareth. Those people at the synagogue looked up and realized that they were looking at one of their own. Isn't this Joseph's son? And with that recognition, they saw themselves. In that moment of recognition, their own shame cascaded down upon them. He's one of us. There is no way that he could be the chosen one, the anointed one, the Messiah, because we are not enough. Look at us. We are poor. We are colonized. We are failures. We are not enough. And with their not enoughness, they triggered Jesus' very human shame at that point in his life, at that very early stage of his public ministry. And his response was all too human. It was all to us. They reminded him of all the things that society told him were wrong with him. His defenses came out and took over. And so he rebuked these people, the village that had raised him. Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. We have those defenses too, of course. We shut people out. We turn people down. We run away. We hide ourselves. We raise up our hackles. We build up walls. We block true connection. All because of our shame. All because we believe that we are not enough. And Jesus wasn't alone among the greats of ancient times. In our Old Testament reading today, we see a Jeremiah going through his own bout of not enoughness. This greatest prophet of the Babylonian captivity, of which we learned last week, stood in the very presence of Yahweh, his God, and said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak for I am only a boy. In other words, for I am not enough. <laughs> Even in his all-too-human insecurity and shame, Jesus stood on the shoulders of giants who also had their insecurities and shame. And that's the thing about shame. It doesn't matter how far we get and meeting society's standards. I mean, Jeremiah is pretty hard to beat. We still have this innate sense that we are not enough. But friends, hear the good news, because of course there is always good news. Yes, Jesus left Nazareth in that tirade after they tried to kill him. 
In that moment, he dusted his sandals off and brushed his shoulders off and said, good riddance. But that was not the end for Nazareth, his hometown. Jesus continued to grow into himself, to embrace his identity. He continued to commune with God. He came to understand grace. He came to embody grace. And in that, he came to embody unconditional love. He went out to other towns and villages in the countryside. He met a bunch of bumbling idiots and realized that all they needed in order to become his disciples, the leaders of a movement that would transform the world, was to be told that even with their flaws, they could do it. They were enough. He would teach and preach and reach thousands. He would make it clear that there was nobody outside of his embrace. And yes, that included the people of Nazareth. You see, Jesus found the antidote to shame. In his wanderings amongst the poor people, in his dinners amongst the outcast, in his communing with the lepers, in his camaraderie with the sex workers and the tax collectors and the demon-possessed. In short, in his formation of a community with those who were considered the absolute most shameful of all in the eyes of society, he found something profound. He found that he loved them all without condition, not in spite of who they were, but because of who they were. And they were enough. Unconditional love was the antidote. He began to live it. He began to teach it. He did so to the extent that his disciple John, years later, would boldly proclaim that the very essence of God is love. His teachings eventually made their way to a man named Saul of Tarsus who was leading the persecution and murder of his people, a man who had all the shame in the world to feel. But when he learned the truth of those teachings, everything changed, and he was able to write these words. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Friends, God loves you in the fullness of who you are. And God knows those things that you have buried deep down inside, those things of self-hatred and loathing, those things of guilt, those things of not enoughness, those things of insecurity, <clears throat> those things of shame. In the fullness of all of that, God loves us. God bears all things. God believes in our potential. God hopes for an end to shame's grip on our lives. God endures our struggles with patience. Our societies will ebb and flow and change, and along with them, the standards that dictate shame will change. But God will never end. Amen.